So we are in part two of this series called Foundations, Building Faith with the Essentials. If you missed part one, uh, the point of this series is we're asking, about, I think, a pretty important question. What must a person believe in order to be a faithful follower of Jesus? Not what must one do. We're not talking about doing, doing, doing as much as we're talking about what must one believe. What, what should be the essentials of the faith? And conversely, what might not be essential? What's on the outside? What's on the peripheral? Uh, and in other words, what's essential versus what you've always been taught or told as a kid? What's essential as opposed to what you've picked up along the way from friends or from the internet or some other source? Um, what, is, what is kind of the fundamental pieces um, that we need to know in order to really grow up our faith in Christ? And this is important for a few reasons. Um, one reason it's important to have this conversation is because it's really confusing right now in our current culture, in the current culture of Christianity, because Christianity is like um, a house with a bunch of living rooms in it right now. Each of those living rooms is kind of like a Christian tradition or a Christian expression or some version of Christianity. They each have doors that are open to the outside world because every tradition is trying to invite uh, everybody into their tradition. There's little doors in between those traditions for people who change churches or changes traditions. And what everybody has in common here, that, and there's many more than what's on the screen, but what everybody has in common here, everybody believes they're absolutely right and everybody else is a little misinformed or maybe they're a little bit behind the times. Um, and, and in, including us. Um, but I think, um, I think what's true for all of us is we probably have some things wrong, but hopefully we don't have the, uh, the essentials wrong, that we, have the, we, we get it when it comes to the, to the fundamentals, the essentials of the faith. The other thing that makes this confusing is that every generation, going all the way back to the second century, every generation brings some new and novel ideas, and it kind of gets intertwined. It gets woven into some new Christian traditions. Sometimes they're, they're just fads. Sometimes they're very toxic things that have kind of marred the reputation of Christianity um, because they had kind of risen to the point of becoming an essential, becoming an essential dogma or an essential doctrine. And, and some of you experience this because the message uh, that, that you've heard is, look, you have to believe in all of this in order to be a, a, a Christian. And some of you have had some of these negative experiences in the church where you think it doesn't really align, it doesn't quite feel right, it doesn't seem right, and as a result, you left the church, and maybe you left, and maybe your faith suffered as a result. And it was all because of someone, a, a tradition that elevated something that turns out wasn't essential to begin with. And that's, so that's another reason why this is a really important series to be talking about. The question is, what is essential? What's fundamental? Now, part one, and we started a list, and we're going to keep a list. Uh, we began with Peter's declaration of who Jesus is. Uh, Jesus said, hey, hey, who, one day he said, who do you guys think I am? And Peter said, I think I know who you are. You're Jesus. You're the king. You're Messiah. You are God's final king. You are the anointed one. And just like prophets and priests would anoint a man to become a king, we believe God has anointed you as his final king in our world. And what's interesting is Jesus didn't go, whoa, whoa, Peter, slow down a little bit. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, no, he said, he kind of doubled down. He says, you're correct, Peter. Not only are you correct, but God himself, my father himself, has revealed this to you. So we decided last week it's absolutely essential to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he's God's final king. So the item number one on the list is, number one, Jesus is God's son and our king. But Jesus, unlike other kings, did not come in order to draw attention to himself. Uh, Jesus came to do something else, and that's what leads us into our second essential. So during Jesus' final conversation with his followers, with his disciples, right before he was arrested, right before he uh, went to the cross, uh, they're celebrating the Passover meal, and it's evident to Jesus his disciples, his followers, were, his apostles were still very confused about the purpose of his activity among them. He had been with them day and night for almost three years now, 
and yet they're still confused about, you know, why did you drag us all over the place, Jesus? Why did we have to listen to the same sermons time and time again, Jesus? Why all the miracles, Jesus? We thought we knew. In fact, we kind of thought that we knew that we're here at Jerusalem. We kind of expected we're at the end. Maybe tomorrow you're going to throw off your rabbinic robe and you're going to take your proper place on the throne as the king, as the Messiah, and we're going to establish a brand new kingdom here on earth right? And we're going to kick the Romans out, and it's going, to, it's going to be great. It's going to be like David and Solomon all over again. So they had expectations like all of us do. And they had a God box like all of us have a God box. And the God box is something that we collect over time, and they're full of beliefs that inform our expectations of God. But Jesus, in this conversation, continues to say things that doesn't fit inside of their box. And that's why they were troubled. And so Jesus realizes they kind of miss the purpose of him living among them. And unfortunately, yes, many of us still today miss the purpose of Jesus living among us spiritually through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we're in some ways just as confused as the apostles were. So here's what he said to them again. Guys, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In other words, you believe in God, don't you? Then believe also in me. Now, I want to, you to try to imagine somebody who's in a room saying that to you. Imagine you're in a room with somebody and say, listen, to the degree that you believe in me, you believe in God. I mean, that doesn't make sense, right? You would leave the room immediately if someone claimed to kind of be God, right? I mean, if I told you, and you have permission to do this, if I told you to the degree that you believe in me, you believe in God, you have permission to usher me, you know, directly out of this room into a, a safe house of some kind or something like that, because that's crazy. They should have left the room. But, and part of the point of it is this. And this is where it intersects with our God box. When you hear, let me ask you this. When you hear God, when you hear the word God, when you think about God, and when you think of the name Jesus, uh, and, and, and do those two, um, is there any tension between those two, between God and Jesus? Do they conjure up different emotions? Or let me ask you this way, don't answer out loud. Which one do you like better? I mean, which one are you more comfortable with? And, and really, if that creates some tension between those two, well, then you've got to fiddle around a little bit in your God box because Jesus came to resolve that tension. And as long as many of us have been in church and we've heard the Bible stories, and, and yet there's still this tension. There's God right? What's the, what's the music under that? And what's Jesus? What's the music under Jesus? And think about how those two do or do not go together. And Jesus smiles at his followers and you and me, and he says, there should be no tension. He says um, to his followers, if you had really known me, you would know who my father is. Now, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. He's talking about God. You do know God. You do know the Father, and you have seen him because you know me, and you've seen me. And they respond, again, as they should, and the Bible's so honest here. They don't go, absolutely. They don't say that. No, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Um, and Philip, who's sitting there, finally says what the rest of them are thinking, and he's trying not to be impolite, he's trying not to be offensive, um, but, you know, it's not like you say in front of Jesus, nah, come on, <laughs> you're not God, come on. No, I mean, they just came from Bethany, where Jesus um, brought somebody back from the dead, so they knew he was from God, but really God here sitting in a body with sandals on and a beard, and so Philip says, Lord, um, and he's respectful, Lee, Lord, could you just show us the Father, and, and we'll be satisfied. I mean, we're not disputing you. We're not trying to argue with you. But, you know, we do want to know what God is like if you would just show. I mean, we have the Torah. We have the prophets, the Psalms. But God seems far away. The Romans are all over the place. We, we do believe you've come from God. But would you show us the Father? And Jesus is thinking, guys, what do you think I've been doing for the last three years? Why do you think I stuck around? The reason I came is so that you would know what the Father is like. So he says, don't you know me, Philip? 
even after I've been among you for so long, I mean, the miles we've walked together, the campfires that we've built together, all the questions I, I've answered over the years, and all the kind of the boneheaded things that I told you not to do. We're not going to bring, you know, fire down from heaven in order to get rid of the Samaritans. That's not why we're here. I mean, don't you know me, Phil? Why do you think I've been among you for so long? He goes on and tries to convince them. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, so why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. He's getting frustrated. Now, just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And look, if you, if you just don't get it, then take a look at what I've done. At least believe because of the work that you've seen me do. Now, think about this for a second. What if Jesus is as close as we ever get to understanding what God is like? You want to know what God is like? You want to know what God has to say about what you're going through? You want to know what God, God's views is on the world and what's going on in the world? Jesus says it's simple. Just watch me. Just listen to me. Jesus is as close as we get. You see, the Gospels document Jesus, not just his explanation of God, just, not just another explanation of God. Jesus is the best explanation of God. So our first foundational essential, number one, Jesus is God's son and our king. And it leads us to the second. Jesus came to illustrate and demonstrate what God is like. And if that's true, that should do something to your view of God. For those of you who would say the music on this, when I hear about God and when I hear about Jesus, is if there's two different songs there, if there's a tension there, Jesus came to resolve that tension. And let me give you an example of, of maybe how your view of God would change if you really, really did believe this. Because you know that Jesus' reputation, that everywhere Jesus went, um, people who were nothing like him were attracted to him. You know, wherever Jesus went, he spent time with the people who were most lost in that culture, the people who were most hurting in that culture. He spent time and loved being with the people who were considered sinners of his day, the outcasts of his day. That Jesus became known by the religious leaders, and you know this, they kind of were grumbling about him. It's as if he's being friends with sinners. He's hanging out with them all the time. He's eating meals with them. He's breaking all those purity rules because of them. It's as if Jesus is a friend of sinners, and if that is true, then how might that reflect on your view of God? Might your music change if you were to believe that God, because of Jesus, is a friend of sinners, of the lost and the hurting and the marginalized and the outcasts and of you? That means the proper view of God, the music of God, is a positive, friendly God, is a God who is a friend whose relationship as, um, with you is one of friendship because of Jesus, because of what he reflected and what he did. What would it be like if you could get into your God box and instead of God being the God that is the incapable God that we carry around or the God that is the angry and judging God that we carry around, or the distant God, that we would have a more proper view of God that reflects Jesus as a friend of sinner, that God is a friendly God toward you, wants to be your friend. What would that take for you? You know, what would it mean for you to think of God as a friend? In other words, um, that that you would love to be with him, and he loves to be with you wherever you travel, wherever you go. That, that, that no matter what, that God has your back. That you love 
to share everything with God. That, that you wouldn't keep any secrets because friends don't keep secrets with one another, do they? Why would you keep secrets? Why would you pretend to talk to God in a way that wasn't rooted in a friendship relationship? Right? We have a tendency to think, well, I have to talk religious talk whenever I talk to God. No, one of the most powerful prayers that you can ever speak is, is help. What if God became like a perfect friend to you, was always honest with you no matter what, always had your back, someone that you enjoyed doing life together with? What would that be like? And if your relationship with God is not like that, you got to revisit the God box. Because somewhere along the line, you've been told something that is different than that. You know, Judith and I have, we, so we have three boys, two in, uh, UNL, at UNL, uh, one still in high school. And I remember, maybe some of your parents did this, I remember when Judith and I were thinking about having a third child, and it was... Um, you know, we had this conversation or a few conversations, and really we kind of put together a list of pros and cons. We're like, um, okay, let's think about this. Uh, if we have a third, uh, we're going to have to buy a new car, a, a bigger car. We're going to have to get a bigger car. Um, we're going to absolutely grow out of the house that we currently live in. Um, if we have a third child, the poor middle child is going to suffer greatly for the rest of his life. We don't want to do that to him either. Uh, what else? Um, you know, we're, the money is going to be tighter than ever before. We're going to have to, you know, the house already, we just finally cleaned it up. It looked like a war zone for the last five years. It's going to go back to that. I mean, we've already had trouble enough, and then we've got to get up in the middle of the night, and then there's diapers and everything. Even thinking about it, we were exhausted. And then you know what happened? We met Sam. And when you meet somebody you love, everything changes. And when we met Sam, all the sacrifices that we were so concerned about before, we were so willing to make those sacrifices so that we could be with him. Some of you... Some of you are thinking about God like a pro and con list. And you can go down the list. I don't know, if I go all in with God, I mean, is he going to change me into somebody I don't like, like that Christian that I know over there that I don't really like? Do I have to believe all the things in the Bible that I'm not really sure about? I mean, uh, is he going to make me kind of make some sacrifices I don't want to make? And what about that part of my life I just want to keep for my... I don't know if I really want to go... There's too many cons. What about the Christian history? What about, you know, all the things that happened in the history and all the bigots that I know? There's so many cons you can talk yourself right out of going deep with God. And then you know what happens? You meet him. And when you fall in love with God, it changes everything. Because then you're willing to take the sacrifice necessary just so you can be with God. Does it mean giving up a little bit of my money? Of course. Does it mean um, extending a little grace to a, a neighbor if that draws me close to God? Of course. Does that mean I'm going to forgive somebody because God has forgiven me? Yeah, I'll do my best. Why? Not because I have to, not because I'm a slave, not because I'm trying to be religious, but because I just want to be with God. But as long as there's a tension and the music under God is the kind of ominous music where we're like, dun, 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 I don't know if I want to be a part of God, you know, versus the music that we hear with Jesus who loves us and we know he's like a friend and he's got all this grace. What if those two are supposed to come together? Can you resolve the tension? Would you be willing to resolve that tension and open up your God box again, and instead of having all this other junk inside of your God box, you make space in it to begin to operate as if God wants to be the perfect friend that you will not find anywhere else in the world. What if 
That is why Jesus showed up to demonstrate and illustrate what God is really like. So my recommendation, get into the God box, throw out some of the stuff that you've been holding on to, some of the fear, some of the caution. Going 50% is not enough. Go all the way with God, and here's what you're going to discover. You're going to love spending your life with God. That's the promise that he gave in Christ who perfectly showed you and illustrated and demonstrated what God is like. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so grateful that you're like a friend uh, because it's hard to find a good friend in this world. And so, Lord, for all the other stuff that we bring about in our kind of baggage into um, how we think about you, we're sorry. Um, So for anybody and everybody who, this might be brand new news, that we can engage with you just like a friend. We don't have to pretend to be religious. We don't have to pretend to be anything except ourselves because you accept us as as who we are, really who we are. And so, Lord, we're going to breathe in this truth. And the pressure's off. And we have the freedom because you promise to have our back no matter what to lead a life that we're supposed to lead, not because we have to, because we simply want to reflect the friendship and the love that you've given to us. So thank you, Lord. We love you. Amen.